you this morning. Hope you're glad to be here to worship with us. And the first thing we do is we sing some praises to the Lord. So would you stand? Praise band's ready. Well, just about ready. As soon as he gets a little. And we're taking away Rich. My 
come before you this morning and we just thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your house to worship you this morning Lord you are the author of salvation Lord you sent your only son here to hang on that cross and die an excruciating death to cover our sins Lord and because of that we get the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with you that's not the end of the story on the third day he rose again he conquered sin and death and Satan and he went to prepare a place for us. So, Lord, we just lift you up this morning and worship you for the God that you are, the Almighty, all powerful. Lord, all the thing going on, things going on in our country today, Lord, we just look toward you. You are still in control. Some people think you just set things in motion and you step back. But no, Lord, you're actively there. And, Lord, we just make petition to you this morning, Lord, to, to make people in our country know that the, they need to look toward you, Lord, that you can you can take care of everything, every problem if we just lean on you, Lord. Let us trust in you. Just be with our leaders and all the things going on in this world today. May, help them make decisions which are godly and, and right with you, Lord. Lord, just bless each and every one that's gathered here this morning. Fill this place to overflowing with your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, that we can feel you moving among us, Lord be truly changed because we've been bathed in your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated, before we get to our prayer concerns, I want to invite Ben, Lydia, and Faith up here on stage. And I also want to invite Roy Bose. Pete, are you going to come up to. Pete Sweetie's going to join us as well. Where, Where is Ben and Lydia? <laughs> you too. I knew you'd be up to something. <laughs> Could you hear your name? You guys can come on up here. We usually do it down there, but I want to make sure people people see you. 
years ago when my youngest son graduated, he made the comment that his, the kids in his class were 50% single parent families. So I was reading in the Bible and uh, back in those days when they wanted to build an altar, they had to gather up a bunch of rocks and build an altar. And uh, I was reading in my Bible about where they were crossing Jordan and they had to, each tribe had to bring the rock and they built an altar out of that rock and a reminder that that day they crossed the River Jordan flood level on dry ground. Now think about that. Flood level river, they crossed on dry ground. That doesn't happen every day. So my, my mind thought and God worked on me and I came up with, I made a stake and the object is that certain points in our life, we drive a stake where, and if we have to start, we go back to that last stake and go from there forward. Like graduation, marriage, kids, kids graduations. <laughs> You, you kind of see where my mind went that day was progressively. And the, the thing with the, the thoughts of Logan's graduating friends was they got a stake. They, they may not have went to church. They got a stake. The stake is to be driven in the ground and to remind you that we're all proud of you today. Graduation and working hard all those years in school and your little brains of mush becoming, <laughs> you understand, it, just teasing. But it's uh, that we're proud of you today, and this is an accomplishment. And I catch kids that, I say kids because I'm 58, when they come out of college, I give them a stake, another stake to drive in the ground. If they have to come back and start, you only have to come back this far to start to go on and know that we're proud of you. And so I gave them each a stake out there because we used to give them to them and then they'd sword fight. And, but, uh, <laughs> that was where my mind went with this thought and that is why we do this is as a church, we're proud of them today, right? Didn't hear much applause, but, <laughs> but Pete has the talent part because God gives everybody a talent and how you use that talent is how God works in your life. So I'll turn that over to him. And... We all have different talents, and uh, these three up here have already uh, definitely displayed some already, so we want to back them. Uh, what we do is uh, these coins that I have are just uh, presidential ones. They're not worth a whole lot. It's more the recognizing the talents that each of these have, and you probably follow them through the years. Uh, we don't have a Abenus or a, what is this county, Wapolo, but the best I could do is a, a presidential coin of Van Buren, so we'll do that. So I'll, I'll present that to each of them here. Just to remind you of your talents that we recognize them too, so it's only worth a dollar. So. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Roy. This has become a tradition to have Roy and the stake to drive in. And I do want to remind you that this will always be your home. You'll always be welcome back here. I have a few scripture passages that I, I want you to read, or I'm going to read to you. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's Deuteronomy 31, 8. Uh, Colossians 3, 23 is one of my favorites. Ben, we were just talking about W-Y-D, whatever you do. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And then the last one is a familiar one. And this is on the youth room wall if you need to read it again. First Timothy 4.12, do not let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Um, 
Ben and Lydia, when we moved into town, um, they were probably in what, second grade? And Lydia became one of Ben's first friends. And they've been friends ever since. And so they're obviously very special to me. And then Faith, how old were you when you started attending the church? Probably maybe fourth or fifth grade, somewhere in there. And um, all three of them have been involved in this church. Um, haven't missed many Sundays. And... Um, and involved and so I appreciate them so very much and for and, and especially for Ben and Lydia these two have been an example for their entire class um, and the principal would often call them these two in if they needed if he needed them to do something or needed someone to do something and so they especially have been um, an important part of that school and good representation for Christ as well. And Faith, I know you've been representing Christ well down in Van Buren as well. Uh, I just wanted to quickly mention um, our church has sponsored one scholarship out at Cardinal so far and it's awarded and Lydia received that scholarship. It's done through Dollars for Scholars and so, Lydia, we're proud of you for that. And then the Cardinal Baccalaureates um, offers two scholarships. And the people, they write a, uh, an essay answering two questions. Um, where has God worked in your past? And where do you see him working in the future? And we gave out two scholarships. It's all the churches in Elton gives out two scholarships to... Uh, cardinal students and we normally present it at the baccalaureate uh, but this year we didn't have the baccalaureate and it just so happened that the two award winners are ben and lydia and so congrats to you too so i thought i'd present here today so here's what i want you to do i want you to tell what school you graduated from and what your future plans are whatever they look like and if you want to sing a solo, go ahead, Lydia, because you've sung a few here. Um, oh gosh. I graduated from Cardinal High School, um, and I plan on going to Iowa State. I'm majoring in Agricultural Systems Technology, which is a STEM major of Ag Engineering. So, yeah. I graduated from Cardinal, and I'm going up to Iowa State for athletic training. I graduated from Van Buren, and I'm going to go to Kirkwood for business. Very good, very good. And so once again, um, be praying for these three. And especially, we don't know exactly what the fall uh, holds for all of them. But church, I'm going to tell you, these three have represented you well, and Christ well, our faith well, and their school well. So Great job, Faith, Ben, Lydia. All right, you can go sit down. Now. And so they'll be standing out at their displays. Make sure you look, there's some great pictures and you can really see uh, their growth. That is one advantage. I've been here almost 11 years now. It is so much fun watching uh, young women like Faith and Lydia and young men like Ben grow up into who God designed them to be. And so um, just uh, it's just an exciting day for sure. So prayer concerns, again, pray for the seniors. Uh, pray for our nation. Just when I think uh, things can't get any more crazier. It does. So pray for our nation. I also want to mention pray for Bob Wells, who's in hospice. And uh, we had put a call out and it, it appeared as though he was doing well. Um, and I got a card from Maryland saying, hey, he, he was doing well. And then next thing I know, uh, he's at his home in Des Moines. 
uh, in hospice. And so please pray for him and pray for Marilyn and, and their family. Uh, this week I had a funeral. Uh, my cousin Nancy Morrison I buried over in Creston and so pray for my family. I would appreciate that. She had just retired from Bunomatic Coffee Makers and, and retired and and then she uh, had two months to live after that. So it was unfortunate. Any other prayer concerns that I can add to the list? Okay. Did you say Jerry Dunn? Yeah, oh, okay. Leukemia. Emma? My grandma coffin is going to go in lady surgery on Tuesday. Okay. Grandma coffin going in for knee surgery. Thank you, Emma. Jack? Okay, so Terry Ballard's classmate, Mike Peterson, passed away. Any others? Yes. Okay, so we've been praying for Ruth Ann Johnson, but her husband, Roger, um, has had kidney stones, and so he's been trying to take care of her and, and deal with the kidney stone. Roy? Can you repeat that, Patsy's? Oh. Yeah, so Patsy's sister is on chemo. We need to keep praying for her. Jenny? Okay, definitely. So Kay Williams um, is in hospice at her home. And is it, if you want a visitor, she's up for visitors on occasion. And so just call first to make sure that it, it would be okay. And she'll be up front with you whether she's not. Any others? Okay. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have all of these names that we just humbly submit to you. Lord, we've lost a few people that we know. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pray for their families. Lord, bring them comfort. Give them strength as well. And an extra ounce of wisdom to deal with everything. And Lord, let them just go through the grieving process and walk with them by their side. Lord, we pray for those that are uh, in need of healing. And Lord, I just pray for that total healing today. Lord, just course through their body and provide that healing. Lord, we pray for uh, the senior class and those uh, in our midst, especially. And, uh, and Lord, we just... Uh, Pray for Ben and Lydia and Faith 
And Lord, just move in a mighty way through their life. I pray that you give them a vision. Let them see what's in store for them. And Lord, give them the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, everything that it may take. Uh, Lord, teach them to work hard and to uh, have their eyes set on something. And then, Lord, I just pray that you clear a path for them and move in a mighty way through their life. And Lord, in the end, let them make a big difference in this world. And so, Lord, we have all of these things as well as all the needs that our nation has. And Lord, we just humbly ask you to, to, to touch our nation. And Lord, I pray that you put it on each one of our hearts and in our minds to be the very best citizen that we can be. And Lord, just guide our every thought, our every action. And Lord, I just pray that our nation may wake up and turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, I want to invite you, if you brought uh, tithes and offerings, we have a box in the back. Instead of passing the collection plate like we used to, we're just asking you that you put it in the tithes and offerings box in the back if you haven't done it already. And I want to invite the children to meet Michelle and LaVon. Michelle will have preschool through third grade. LaVon, the fourth through sixth graders. And I'll pray a blessing on the children and their teachers. Let's pray for the kiddos. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask blessings upon all the kids. Lord, you know how many hairs are on their head and you weave them together in their mother's womb and you love them and you care for them. And so, Lord, keep them safe, not only here in the classroom, but Lord, when they depart from here or just look after them and love them. Let them feel your presence. And Lord, we thank you for uh, calling Michelle and LaVon into the children's ministry and we ask that you bless them and their time with the children in jesus name amen have fun up there maybe we'll hear them they're having so much fun i want to invite you to turn with me to first kings 19 first kings 19 and i'm going to read 9 through 18 so 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18. My Bible entitles this Elijah at Horeb. This is what the author wrote. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What have you been doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces in the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king over Aram, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, 
you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. It shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Yet I'll leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed the Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. That's God's word for us today. Okay, would you join me as we ask a blessing on Pastor Mark this morning? Lord, Heavenly Father, we just lift Pastor Mark up before you this morning. Just anoint him with your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, as he brings your message. Lord, let it be a, something concise and, a, and something we can understand. And, Lord, something that we can glean from, from your scriptures, something that we haven't noticed before, and something that we can use in our lives. Lord, just bless him now as he brings this message that you placed upon his heart, Lord, and may it be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Don, I heard you pray that it be concise. <laughs> um. I want to tell you a quick story because I found this to be kind of funny. So um, so my cousin passed away. That's not the funny part, please. Um, but uh, I was going over to Creston, Iowa. If you know where Creston is, it's on Highway 34 on the other side of the state on past uh, I-35 in Osceola. And so I was going to meet my brother who was coming from Packwood. And we're going to meet in Albia, Jack's town. And we stopped at Hy-Vee and I was waiting for him. And he said, hey, are, are you at Hy-Vee or Albia yet? And I said, yeah, where are you? He said, I'm in the Corvette. Really? Okay, why don't you drive? <laughs> and uh, we got there fast. No. And, uh, and so I rode to this funeral in a 2018 Chevy Corvette, and um, and I get out, and, and my family and the funeral home's like, who's getting out of there? And they're like, the preacher. <laughs> and so one of my cousins, who's very ornery, comes up to me and says, boy, you must be sending a lot of people to heaven. <laughs> um, God's been good to you. And I said, let's get something straight. This isn't my Corvette. <laughs> but I was riding in style that day. That was a lot of fun. And I thank my brother for driving me over there. It was a lot of fun. Well, today we're continuing on in uh, this sermon series. We're on uh, the 39th uh, story uh, out of 100 stories. Uh, that we're going through the most essential stories of the Bible. At, at 50, we're going to break into the New Testament. So hold on. We're not too far from uh, the New Testament. So our key question today is what do we do when we are down? When we have the doldrums? When we're just not feeling as peppy as everyone around us? What do we do? The key idea is, as Christians, we'll sometimes wear out physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Have you ever been there? You just wear yourself out. But we don't have to stay there. Now, listen to me. I'm not talking about clinical depression. If you have clinical depression, uh, definitely come talk to me. See someone they can help you. There's a difference between having the doldrums and being clinically depressed, and you may need some additional help. So just make note of that. One of the key scriptures, there's going to be several, but I, I just kind of picked this one out because I liked it. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and it licked up the water and the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate. And cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And that is going to be a story that I cover through the story of Elisha. You're going to learn, not Elisha, Elijah. Elijah is considered the greatest prophet that has lived. And so we're going to learn about Elijah. So uh, this story gets me thinking about uh, Elijah. And it was this, that uh, 
a woman, she was a widow, her husband died, decided to uh, go into a pet store and find something that could keep her company. So she went into the pet store and said, you know, my husband died. Could you recommend a pet that would keep me company? Oh, the owner had the perfect solution, a parakeet. Does anyone have a parakeet here? Yes, good. And so this parakeet would keep this widow happy and be able to carry on a conversation with her. And so she was so excited and she got the parakeet home in the cage and just started talking to it, talking to it. Wait, nothing would, the bird would never say anything back. And so she got frustrated and she went to the pet store and said, I think I got a dud for a parakeet. Maybe its voice box is missing something. I don't know. It's not talking. And he goes, oh, what you need to do is get it a swing. That'll make it happy and it'll want to talk to you. Boy, that bird got to swinging and swinging and swinging. Still didn't talk for another week. So he went back, or she went back to the pet store and says, he said, the owner says, I tell you what, buy this ladder and you'll have everything you need. It'll want to climb up and down, swing, 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 climb up and down. So for a week, that's what that silly bird did, not a peep out of it. And then she goes back and says, hey, I've got these two things, but it still won't talk to me. So he says, I tell you what, it needs a ledge, a perch to sit on, and then it'll be happy. It'll have everything that it needs. Well, lo and behold, the next week, the parakeet died. And so um, she went in there, took the parakeet back and said, I think I need another one, or maybe let's switch to a different pet. But the parakeet died. I'd like my money back. Said, well, just out of curiosity, did the parakeet say anything before it died? Said, yeah, its last words were, doesn't that pet store have any food? Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. So um, that was, was that a good dad joke or I need to get better? Okay. Um, it, uh, so often, especially when we get down, sometimes we're neglecting ourselves. And we're not, we, we forget about the very most basic needs we have in our life. And that's what can get us into the doldrums. And you'll learn through Elijah's life, uh, when he gets down, it's the basics of life that sends him in that progression. And so we need to remember that. Before I get going, I'm going to give you some precursors, some some prerequisites in understanding where we are and, and what the culture is like. And so, Tony, I've got a slide there that is a timeline. Uh, maybe a little bit tough reading there, but um, on the left-hand side, you'll see a crown. And what that is meaning is up until this point, we've had the different kings We've had Saul and David and Solomon. And now all of a sudden we get to a divided monarchy. Israel splits into two nations. Israel is the northern nation represented by that top line. And Judah is represented by the bottom line. And that's the southern kingdom. Now if you notice, the northern kingdom is overthrown in 722. And the southern kingdom goes on a little bit longer. And so we're in the beginning part of the north and the south kingdom. And so this is regarding Israel and the northern kingdom, this whole story of Elijah. And so going on to the next slide, we have Solomon. We had just learned about Solomon. Now Solomon brought to Israel two negative things. Solomon wasn't a terrible king per se. But he let two things slip in. One was he took on many wives. God didn't really bless this idea of many wives. And, but the reason Solomon did it was as form, to form treaties. They would offer, in the form of a treaty, they would offer him wives and he would take them. And the negative side of that is the wives would always bring in foreign gods. 
And so this led to idols and, and worship of, in this case, Baal. And so God did not like that. So here's a little bit of the divided monarchy. Israel was the northern kingdom. Ultimately, they were faithless. That's why they were overthrown so quickly. Judah was a southern kingdom. And I say they pseudo-followed God because they had periods of time where they were faithful. And so God blessed that time and it extended their life a little bit longer. Ultimately, Israel lasted 210 years. Judah lasted 345 years. A couple more things I want you to know is Baal, this idea, this, this God with a little g. He was an idol and they worshiped him and he was known as the God of storms. This becomes very uh, interesting, understanding this point about Baal when it comes to his duel with uh, Elijah. And so uh, associated with the God of storms comes rain and fertility, and then they would have temples and sacrifices. The other thing about this Baal is they only worship this, this cult only worship him for a short time, according to history. Like it wasn't around a, a long time. So here's the key figures in this story. One is King Ahab. I describe him as an apathetic king. He was kind of like, whatever will be, will be, you know, um, just kind of live in life. Uh, didn't care about much. But he married, through one of these treaties, he married a woman by the name of Jezebel, became his wife, and she led the worship of Baal and creating temples and things like that. So God didn't bless that. Then comes Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah is King Ahab's assistant, but what's interesting is he protected God's prophets. Uh, it would remind you of Schindler and Schindler's list, right? He would protect them and hide them in caves as long as he could, even though he was King Ahab's assistant. And then comes Elijah. And I simply describe Elijah as the greatest prophet you'll read about in the Bible. And so here I am, I'm picking up in uh, verse seven or chapter 17 of First Kings. And so Elijah starts out, and I'm going to summarize this, but know that I'm going through starting in chapter 17. So Elijah predicts a drought. He looks around and he says, God is not going to bless what is going on in this nation. And, and there's going to be a drought. And so the word of the Lord come to him. And then he, uh, God told him to go. Uh, and find this particular widow and her son. And, and go and you're, you are to go and, and ask for a, a drink and some food. And so uh, he does that. And she says, I can give you a drink, but all I have are these ingredients. I can't really make a full bread. And besides, my son and I don't have much to eat or drink. And so uh, uh, he says, God's going to bless you. And until this drought's over, you're always going to have enough food and have enough water. And so she's faithful and uh, God blesses her. But then uh, some time passes and this woman finds Elijah and says, my son has died. And Elijah goes in and Healing happens in many different ways in the Bible. In this case, he spread himself over the boy and the boy was raised to life. And this woman recognizes that the God of Elijah should now be her God. And so uh, Elijah, I'm in chapter 18 now. I'm cruising through this passage fast for time's sake. Um, he meets up with Obadiah, King Ahab's assistant, and he says, I want to meet with uh, King Ahab. 
And Obadiah says, I don't feel comfortable with this because ultimately you're going to tell him bad news and then he's going to come after me because I told him to listen to you. Well, Elijah ends up getting a meeting with King Ahab and in 1817 it says when Ahab saw Elijah Ahab said to him is this you you troubler of Israel and this was Elijah's response I haven't troubled Israel but you and your father's house have because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals can you imagine walking into a king putting your finger in his face and saying I'm not the troubler you're the troubler can you imagine that? But that's what Elijah did. And Elijah was bold right to the king's face. And then in verse 19, now then send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. He's saying, gather all these prophets. You see, this is getting down to be a battle. It's a battle between Asherah and Baal and all of their prophets, all 850 of them, versus Yahweh, God, and one prophet, Elijah. That's an epic battle, is it not? And so all of them do as, as Elijah had asked, and he goes, Elijah addresses them. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? I feel like in this nation, we're almost at this place. We have different prophets trying to sell you different things and different messages. And then we have the prophets of today trying to say, this is what God is going to bless. Choose now who you're going to follow. And so here it is, he's saying, how long are you going to do this? You need to choose who you're going to follow. And so uh, um, Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen. Let them choose one ox for themselves, cut it up, place it on the wood, put no fire under it. I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put and I will not put a fire under it. And then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people said, that's a good idea. If I would have been there, I would have been like, I'm not sure this is a good idea. But they thought it was a good idea. And so Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves, prepare it first for you are many and call on the name of your God, but no, put no fire under it. And they took the ox that was given to them and they prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. They leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon and that Elijah mocked them and said, call out with a loud voice for he is a God. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. And so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances under the blood gushed out of them. When midday, when midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice and no one answered and no one paid attention. Nothing happened. And Elijah knew that that's the way it was going to be. And Elijah said to the people, come near me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, very symbolic, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. 
So the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood, cut the ox in pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he said, fill four pitchers with water, pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. So Elijah was getting kind of arrogant about it. While they were praying and dancing, here came uh, Elijah saying, oh, Keep dancing to your God. Maybe shout a little louder so you can wake him up. It was a battle. It was a real battle. It was a spiritual battle. And then Elijah, when it gets to his turn, builds the altar. Just like the others. But this one, he said, go ahead, pour water on it. Go ahead, fill it up. Make sure it fills up this trench around it as well. And he says, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, that I'm your servant, that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God, that you have turned their heart back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. You could just picture every last drop being consumed. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophet of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. And they seized him. They took him down into a valley and slew every last one of the prophets. And so he addressed Ahab. There had been a drought and he said, go ahead. Go ahead and eat and drink. And then he goes and he tells his assistant, go up onto the, the cliff. Tell me, is there a cloud? No, no cloud. And he goes and he does that. Time after time after time. And finally, the assistant comes back and says, there's a cloud forming. The drought is ending. You see, you understand the significance. Baal is the storm god, the, the god of lightning, they thought. He should have been able to throw a bolt down, consume that with no problem. The drought that Elijah told them. Baal, the god of storm, should have been able to send rain and fertility and everything that they needed at that time. Nothing. He went directly after Baal with all he had, right with his, at Baal's so-called strength, right? And only God could send the lightning and only God could send the rain. And so God sent the rain. And it said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. Go up, say Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so the heavy shower does not stop you. So then Ahab goes back, tells his wife Jezebel, the one who's been building all these Baal altars, what had happened. I'm shocked she wasn't there. But Ahab told her all that had been done. And she said, we need to kill Elijah. And so Elijah went from being this bold, magnificent prophet that could command and God would listen to a man on the run, scared for his life. In verse four, but he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. 
Just imagine this. You command God to burn up this with all, all this wood and all this water and this ox. And God does it on command. And next thing you know, you don't think he has the power to save you. Instead, you're asking God to go ahead and end your life sooner than later. And he said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. But then an angel came touching him and he said, arise, eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord come again, arise, eat, because your, the journey is too great for you. And so he arose and he ate and drank. And that gave him strength to flee for 40 days and 40 nights to Oreb, the mountain of God. And so here he is. If you read the last newsletter, I actually wrote about this story. And God says to him, what have you been doing here, Elijah? God already knew the answer to that question. What are you doing here? God knew why he was there. He was fleeing. He was scared. He thought God had abandoned him. And he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And I seek my life to take it away. And then God tells him to go stand outside. And there was a wind that was starting to break down the mountains. This was a strong wind. And what he was saying is, I'm not the wind. If you think that's powerful and you see mountains crumbling, I'm far more powerful than that. And then he sent the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. If you think an earthquake is powerful, God is even more powerful than that. And then fire, we all know the power of fire. And yet God is more powerful than the fire. And then after the fire comes a gentle blowing. A lot of translation says a gentle whisper. Isn't that ironic? That though he is powerful to, enough to move mountains, that he can speak the world into existence and he speaks to us with a gentle whisper. And so he tells Elijah, what are you doing here again? You just saw my power in great form. Just the taste of it. Now tell me again what you're doing here. And he pleads with God and reminds God that his people's been unfaithful. And they won't listen to him. They want to kill him. And God says, it's time for you to go back and to anoint different kings and different prophets. And we know that the rest of the story is that God blesses Elijah, that he took Elijah without him ever dying, took him straight into the sky. He was faithful to Elijah. So all Christians get down sometimes. In scripture, we read about Elijah, the greatest prophet, and he was down. We learn about Paul. Paul got down. In Acts 18, 5, 
when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said, your blood will be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And then it goes on to say that the Lord spoke directly to him by vision and says, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I'm with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you. And I have many people in this city. Paul went on to do great things to write the majority of the New Testament. But even he got discouraged and down. So God will help us up. One is through scripture and prayer. I think about times in my own life. I've, I've been worn out. I've been tired. I've been sick. Physically sick. And I'll turn to scripture and I'll read exactly what I need to read. There's been times where I thought I was supposed to be reading one thing in my devotional. And for some reason, I read it wrong and I turned to the passage I needed to hear that day. God will speak through scripture and through prayer. You know, prayer is a two-way conversation. Most people don't really grasp this about prayer. But prayer is your petitions, but it's also you listening to what he has to say. He, he had a gentle whisper for Elijah. For us, maybe it's a prompting he puts on our hearts, or maybe it's something we know we need to do. God has different ways to speak to us. And sometimes he even speaks with an audible voice. Also, if you're down, you have the doldrums through meeting with others or you're in worship. Don't cease to be around others. If you're feeling down, you need the strength of other people. You know, last year when I had my kidney stones and it was all summer, I was in pain. And finally, I had the, the surgery. The, the next three or four days, I was in a depression. And you can ask Sheila and Michelle, I would come over and, and just at times cry. And for no reason, for absolutely no reason other than I was depressed. But I needed to be around other people. And by meeting and worshiping together, we can build each other up. We can encourage each other. That's why this congregation, we have to be encouragers. We don't need to be judgmental. We don't need to be discouragers. We need to be encouragers. I think about, uh, I read this story uh, this week about, it happened in Iowa and it was in a town similar to Eldon where the flood had come. And the little boy was helping his parents. And one army had his, just dragging his luggage along the way. And then the other army had his baby brother carrying him like a football. And he was hobbling along. And a man comes up to him and he says, my, it looks like your load is heavy. Can I help? And he goes, oh, he's not heavy. He's my brother. We've heard that line, but this boy somehow knew that. When we help each other, we're helping our brother or sister, not that they're heavy, right? And so by when someone's down, we pick them up. And then also we get back out of it through rest and refreshment. Did you notice what did Elijah forget to do? Eat. That's one thing I've never been accused of, forgetting to eat. But God reminded him through an angel, you need to eat. You need to care for yourself. Sometimes I think self-care goes way, way, way too far in today's society. 
but we need to take care of ourselves. We need to make sure we're eating healthy and we're eating good and that we're getting plenty of rest. I notice sometimes when I get down, it's because I'm simply tired and I need a good night's rest. Make sure you're taking care of yourself and that you're resting. And remember the Sabbath? Sundays are a gift from God to us to remind us to rest, to get recharged and renewed. So let me end with this. How now shall I live? Calm and quiet yourself. There's enough noise in this world that we need to calm ourselves and remind ourselves to be quiet. And remember that God will speak to us in prayer. And remember in prayer, listen for the gentle whisper, the nudging, the prodding, the poking that God may do in our life. And then last, listen for the encouragement of others. When you're down, listen to what other people have to say. Let them encourage you. Let them pick you up. And then there's the flip side of that. Be the encourager. Lift them up. Encourage other people, especially those that you know are down. This society has a way of beating those that are already down. But as Christians, we're called to lift them up. Don't let them stay down. If you know someone is down, don't give up on them. Don't stop. Be persistent. And lift them up. I want to invite the praise band to come up. We know that Elijah saw great and mighty things. And those that are serving Christ, it's real easy to get down. As pastors, it's easy. As parishioners that are serving, uh, it's real easy to get bogged down, weighted down. You see so much brokenness in the world, you try to keep it all to yourself. But in reality, we need to give it to God. I don't know where you're at right now in your life or anything, but maybe you need a simple prayer, maybe a simple word of encouragement. Maybe you need healing. Come, let me pray with you. It doesn't have, I don't have to involve everybody. It can just be between you and I, or maybe you just want to come to the altar and let it be between you and God, and that is fine as well. Maybe you've never accepted Christ. Maybe you've never made the decision to say, I want to follow this risen Savior in Jesus Christ. I want to learn more. I don't have it all figured out, but I want to learn more. Won't you come and let me pray with you? Let's stand and sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, and to know the same. Oh.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are learning to trust you each and every day. Lord, sometimes it's hard, but Lord, we need to remember what you've done for us and what you've done in our life. And so, Lord, we just turn to you today. And Lord, we ask that you guide our every step. Lord, let us have more and more faith. And Lord, when we get down, Lord, I pray that we may get refreshed and renewed in Jesus' name. Amen. Don has some announcements for us. Okay. By the way, I thought that was pretty concise. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, today, immediately following this meeting, there is a congregational meeting. Um, uh, also, uh, this evening, preschool and pre-K graduation at 6 p.m. Uh, there's some little orange dots on the stage. You can't see it from back there, but that's what they're for. Evidently, they get to stand there. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's at 6 p.m. this evening. Friday is Helping Hands at noon. Next Saturday at 8 a.m. is a deacon's meeting here at the church. And uh, next Sunday evening is the uh, preschool roundup from 5.30 to 7 p.m. So also coming up are the Victory Sports Camps. And Lisa looks like she has something she needs to share with us. Hi. Okay, well, this is the last week I'll be up here talking about Bible Reading Marathon. Um, it is finished today, or we're having, at least in Van Buren, we're having the gathering for the finale. Um, I want to take the poster, so if you haven't uh, finished marking off any chapters that you read, uh, please do that before you leave today. I uh, just want to thank everyone who participated, and just as Governor Reynolds says in her proclamation, we need to continue reading up until the day the Lord comes. So I just want to encourage y'all to keep doing that. All right. I want to invite the seniors. You can go and stand at your board. And so if you want to go uh, visit them and see their pictures and things, and, and uh, there's a place that you can put cards and even money, um, they'll accept that, I'm pretty sure. Um, but uh, you can visit them out there. They'll they'll be there. Make sure to encourage them as well. Well, I think we're ready to sing our closing sure. song. Be all the children of God. 